everybody, welcome to The Message. Monty here, and I'm so excited to share today's message with you all. We are in an amazing series called Healthy Thinking. And I know that we all want to have better thinking, right? We all want to have more healthy thinking, right? And these few weeks, we're going through different categories, different areas of life that I believe we can achieve more healthy thinking in. And so today, we're going to be talking about legalism, and grace. Legalism versus grace. I call this message, Why Do I Struggle With Grace? Have you ever thought about that as a Christian, as a believer, or even not as a believer? The struggle with the concept of grace. What is grace? Is it really free? Can I really just receive? Are you sure that I don't have to work hard to achieve this so-called amazing gift? We're going to talk about it today. So I want to start with a fun question fun question for you all. And that is, how do you think God sees you today? I want you to think about it. How does God see you today? How does God see you this week? Hmm, how was your week? How does God see you this month? Hmm, maybe I did this and I did that. And hmm, I want, how do you think God sees you? So this is a bit of an unfair question. This is a bit of a trick question because the answer is, God always sees you as his daughter or as his son whom he loves. That's the answer to the question. And so if you were thinking about this and thinking about, I didn't do this right or I didn't do that right, maybe God looks less at me or I have to try to earn God's love, then I think we're living more in legalism than we are living in grace. So why, why are we like this, <laughs> right? Why do we struggle with these areas of maybe self-image, why do we struggle with these areas of just being confident in what I can do, be confident in what God can do in my life, what God can do through my life? Is it because of the words that have been spoken over me? Maybe negative things were said, maybe negative labels have been put over your life. What is it that makes us think that we are our own worst enemy? Because I know there's a saying in English, we say you're your own worst enemy. And I remember one time I was talking with my dad, Pastor Rod, and we were having this conversation and I was probably feeling insecure about something, about leadership or stepping into a new role or something like that. And I remember my God kind of, I remember dad saying, we were walking along and he was, looked at me and he was like, why don't you believe in yourself? Everyone else believes in you except for you. And that, that struck me. I was like, really? <laughs> is that how it is? Why? Why are we like this? Why? I had to ask myself, well, why am I like this? Why don't I see the best in myself? Why do I see the worst in myself? And so simply, we're all sinful, right? We all have made mistakes. We've all done wrong or thought wrong or said wrong. And this, this sinfulness actually leads us to be legalists as well. Did you know that we're basically all legalists? What? What does that mean? What is legalism? Is legalism just simply following the law, following the rules? When there's a red light, you don't jaywalk, even if there's no cars. Japanese are really good at this. There's no cars anywhere in sight, and they will wait for the light to turn green. <laughs> because there's, a, there's good law in society, societal law, that keeps us from entering into chaos and mayhem. <laughs> But legalism is not an external thing, it's an internal thing. We're talking about a, in, a heart issue here. And legalism is usually always focused on the self, focused on myself, focused on my, me, I, all of these internal things. It takes us and makes us focus on just ourself. That's what legalism does to us. That's what legalism in our heart will produce. It's also, um, it's, we, sometimes we think legalism is what I can do for God, right? It's God responding to what I can do for Him or people responding to what I can do for them. So if I go on a trip and I buy some goodies and I come back and I give them goodies, guess what? They then feel the obligation to when they go on a trip, have to come back and bring me goodies. <laughs> you understand? In Asia, in Japan, we have this culture. In Japan, we call it omiyage, where you have to take something from a different place and you give it back. And then it kind of, it, it spurs this on in our heart where it's out of obligation. 
that I have to give. That's what legalism looks like in our heart. It's an obligation. I have to. If I don't do this, then I'm not meeting up to the standard. And that is what the law does. It shows us what the standard is. And that's what the law in the Bible does. It showed us what God's standard was for us. And unfortunately, we all fall short. We'll read about that in a moment. But we all fall short of the standard. We all make mistakes. And this year, we've been talking about truth and grace. The balance of truth and grace. Let me read that scripture really quickly. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I love this. Because the law, yes, it did come from Moses. God said, hey, Moses, these are the laws. We've got the Ten Commandments and about 175, I don't know, it's a random number. But there's a lot of laws in the Old Testament that people felt that they had to live by. And it says Jesus came with truth and grace. There's a story in the Bible that I really love. I love this story because it shows us the difference between what law says, what legalism says, and what grace says says. So let's read this story in John 8. We're going to read from verse 1. So Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. He loves it. He can't stay away. (laughs) And a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, not after the act of adultery, in the act of adultery and they put her in front of the crowd. So when we read this story, we need to ask ourselves the question, where's the man? It takes two to tango. Where's the guy in this equation? They found this woman. Maybe it was a setup. Maybe they had planned this from the beginning. They paid off the guy. Hey, get this woman and we're going to get her and we're going to get Jesus because that's the ultimate goal is they want to trick up. They want to trip up Jesus with these things. So they find this woman in the act and they bring her in front of the crowd. She could be wearing nothing at this moment. She could be in the most seen, the, the most shame of her life, the most embarrassing moment of her life, the most guilty moment of her life and they throw her in front of this crowd of people, this crowd of onlookers and everyone is like, oh, this woman, oh, she's bad or oh, she did a bad thing because they know what the law says. And we're going to read what happens. They say to Jesus, teacher, I don't know, (laughs) it's my my Palpatine voice, (laughs) the emperor, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. (laughs) That doesn't, not very good Palpatine. (laughs) But the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? So the law says this woman's act, she did a bad act, therefore the punishment, the reward is death. That's what she deserves because of this act. That's what the the law said. Jesus, what do you say? And this is really funny because Jesus, it's like they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. And they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. I love Jesus. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle with the crowd with the woman. And so we all want to know, what did Jesus write in the dust? Right? What was it that he was writing in the dust? Was he writing their names one by one? He's like, Alfred, <laughs> Jeffrey, <laughs> My man, like, was he writing their names? Was he writing the sins that they committed? What was he writing? I don't know, but there was an order to it because it says these people left from the oldest to the youngest. So these guys, also being human, also being imperfect, also having sin in their life, they understood that they had sin and that they, they couldn't say anything. Jesus had had won this round, so to speak. And then it says Jesus was there and he was left with the woman. Then uh, Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. 
go and sin no more. I love this. I love this example because we see legalism versus grace. And grace wins every time. Because Jesus, full of grace and truth, was there. He said, anyone that has never sinned can throw the first stone. And everyone left, but Jesus was still there. Why? Because he had never sinned. You see, Jesus was justified to be the one to bring judgment. He could have said, but I condemn you. I will throw the first stone because of the law, because of what it says, because you deserve this punishment. But Jesus said, no, neither do I. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. That is the heart of Jesus. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Amen. And Jesus wanted to save this woman, but he also wanted her to to live a life worthy of her calling. Go and sin no more. See, Jesus doesn't want us to sin. He doesn't want us to keep on sinning. Grace is not permission to keep on sinning. Grace is a gift that we have to save us from sin. Amen? And so this is a perfect example of grace and truth. The problem with the law isn't the law. It's us. You see, the law in of itself is actually a good thing. It is the standard. The standard in of itself is not bad. We, we are the ones with the problem. We are the ones with sin. We are the ones that fall short. We are the ones that are worthy of a punishment. But Jesus came along and said, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. I came to fulfill the law. So Jesus didn't come to get rid of the law. He said, I came to fulfill the law. We are all guilty. The law shows us that. We are all our own worst enemy. We all know that, right? (laughs) That's why. And Jesus came to not abolish the law, not get rid of it, but to accomplish it, to complete it. And the completion of that is grace. So grace is always greater than, greater than, I don't know which way you're walking, (laughs) greater than law. Jesus didn't come to do that. He came to fulfill it. And in Romans 3, verse 21, it says this, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of the glorious standard. Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sin. Come on! This is a beautiful scripture. This is it, guys. This is Jesus coming in grace and truth. We are made right not by fulfilling all of the requirements of the law, not by being simply a good person. We are made right by Jesus, by faith in Jesus, by accepting the free gift that Jesus paid for us when He died on the cross. See, Jesus had to die on that cross to take the punishment away. He took that woman's punishment away when He died on the cross. He took my punishment away when He died on the cross. But Jesus did not stay dead. He rose again three days later and He is alive, living, powerful God, full of grace, wanting to give grace to everyone. Everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So this is news for you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you think about yourself, Jesus died and rose again for you so that you could understand grace so that you could accept the free gift of grace. So here's the gift. What do we do? Just receive. Just receive the gift. Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So we have access to the greatest gift that has ever been given. And it was given freely. No one made God do this. 
No one forced God to do this. He did this. He sent Jesus. Jesus lived his life and died because he wanted to. Because he wants a relationship with you. Because he wants you to receive this amazing gift. Because when you give a gift, you usually give a gift to someone you love, right? Someone you care about. Amen? If you care about them, you feel moved to give them a gift. So what do you do when someone gives you a gift on your birthday? You receive it, right? <laughs> I hope so. What do you do when someone gives you a gift at Christmas? You receive it. Are you then going around trying to pay that person back? No. Why? Because that's the time that you are supposed to receive gifts, right? It's not a time where you think about, I got to pay them back. It's a time where you think about, I just need to receive. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. What a lovely gift. The same thing with grace. When we receive grace, it's not a time to think about, okay, how can I pay God back? Because we can never fully, ever pay back what God has done for us. It is impossible. So we've got to stop trying to earn grace. We've got to stop trying to earn God's love. That is legalism that is driving us to earn what has already freely been given. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so there's this amazing video in Alpha. We love Alpha. We love Alpha Course. And I've seen so many people go through Alpha and, and discovering God more and experiencing life change. And there's a really great video in Alpha that I think really captures this. So let's watch it together now. There once were two little boys who were best friends. They played together, went to school together. They even went to university together. They were inseparable, until their careers took them in very different directions. One became a lawyer, the other a criminal. As one was promoted to a judge, the other disappeared deeper and deeper into a life of crime. Eventually, the criminal was caught and sent to trial. On the fateful day in the courtroom, he came face to face with his old best friend, the judge. And so, the judge had a dilemma. He loved his friend, but he had to do justice. And so he fined him the appropriate penalty for the offense. It was a huge fine. There was no way he could ever afford to pay what he owed. But then the judge took off his robes, went down, stood with his friend, and wrote out a check covering the cost. He paid the penalty himself. What a great video. Isn't that easy to understand about how the judge gave the free pass? That's what Jesus did for us. You see, like in that story with the woman, he had every right to judge her. He had every power at his disposal. He had every authority to pass judgment, to pass death. But no, because he loved her, because he loves you, because he loves me. He gave us the free gift of grace. So when we receive it, then what do we do? Okay, I've believed in Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, we accept grace into our life. So then what do we do? We need to learn to live in grace. Grace is freedom. It is freedom from legalism. It is freedom from insecurities. It is freedom from self-doubt. It is freedom from the bad things that have been done or said over your life. That is not who you are. It is freedom to know who you are. You are a son. You are a daughter in Jesus. That is who you are. And when you understand this concept, you have finally understood grace. That you're not a servant in the house of God. You're not a servant at church trying to earn respect from people, trying to earn your spot, trying to earn your place amongst these other people who you think are better than you. No, no, no. You are a son. You are a daughter. You have a place at the table. Your name is on the chair. God has prepared a place for you. Not because we deserve it, but because he wants us to be there. Yes, you, everything that you've done, everything that you've said, yes, you, even amidst all of that, God has a place for you in his family. He wants all of us to come into his life. The law wants, the law doesn't, law will make us feel guilty. When we focus on that, 
we will feel guilty. But when we focus on grace, we will feel freedom. And I love what it says in Romans 8, 1 to 3. This is so good. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There is no more guilt. There is no more shame. There is no more condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. Because now we have received the gifts of grace. Condemnation doesn't have a space anymore. It needs to go. God doesn't want that to be a part of our life. Verse 2, And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. You are free in the name of Jesus. In, In the name of Jesus, you are free from legalism, from thinking that you have to, that I must, that if I don't, then I'm going to lose. No, no, no. You are free from that. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His Son Jesus in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for all of our sins. Amen. I love this scripture. So what do we need to do when we have bad thoughts? What do we do when we have bad thinking? We're talking about healthy thinking, right? How do I have healthy thinking? Because it's one thing for someone to stand up or be on a screen or on a stage and say, Yay! Grace! But then we go onto our life and we still live with the condemnation. What do we do? We got to get the Word of God in our heart. We got we to gotta grind it into our heart. We got to mash it in like a mashed potato. We got to mash it into our heart. Got to massage whatever. <laughs> I've got too many analogies. All right, I get it. Okay, okay. Get it in your heart. Get these scriptures Memorize it. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, I have this memorized. I have this scripture in my heart because I, as a pastor, still have bad thoughts. I still sometimes have thoughts of condemnation, thoughts of guilt, thoughts of doubt, thoughts of can I do this, thoughts of are you good enough? Even I have those thoughts. So what do I do? I have to say no. I have to say no to those thoughts. I need to recognize that that thought is not a thought from God. That is not a healthy thought. That is a thought from sin, the sinful nature. That is a thought from legalism. That is a thought from the world. That is a thought from the devil. And I need to say no. And I need to be able to fight with the Word of God. I have weapons at my disposal. I have scriptures in my heart that I'm ready to go. When I have bad thoughts, I can fight. I know what to do. I'm not stuck in a moment, in a place where I'm spiraling and going down and down. And Jesus, where are you? We need to learn how to fight. We need to learn what to do. We need to recognize the negative thought. And then we need to say, get lost. I like what Pastor Rod says. He calls it the flick of faith. The flick of faith. (laughs) I love it because that's what we need to do. In faith, flick that away. In faith, no. In faith, Jesus, I am free. In faith, that is not who I am anymore. So we got to practice this. And we can flick that faith. We can can flick in faith the bad things away. Amen? We got to get these scriptures in our hearts. And here's another one that I love that I want to finish with you all. Galatians 5, 1. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up in slavery to the law. For Christians, for believers today, we, we are free. I'm sure you know that you are free. The challenge is to stay free. Amen? We need to stay free when things happen, when the boss is yelling at you, when you make a mistake. We need to learn to stay free. We're not, we, we can't allow condemnation. We can't allow law, legalism back into our heart. We need to say, in Jesus' name, I am free. In Jesus' name, there is no condemnation over my life. By the blood of Jesus, 
for what he did for us on the cross, you are free. So my prayer for you all today is that you would stay free in grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Fantastic. So why don't we pray together? If that's you, why don't you raise your hands and let's pray to God. God, we thank you for the free gift of Jesus, the free gift of grace that you have given all of us. I pray, God, that we would be able to release that control that the the legalism, that the law has over our heart and that we would grab onto you. We would grab onto your word and to your grace. And when we do so, God, I pray that we would experience a fresh freedom in our life. I pray that you would help us to have healthy thinking and healthy habits, that when bad thoughts come, God, that we would flick that away, that we would say no in Jesus' name. We would say, I am free in Jesus' name. I pray that you strengthen everyone here to stay free. And I pray, God, that as we stay free, we will experience more of your grace, more of your blessing. Our lights would shine even brighter as we just understand who we are as a son, as a daughter in your house, in your family. We thank you so much, God, that you chose us, that you wanted us, and Jesus, that you died for us. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. And lastly, I'd just like to pray for anyone who maybe knows that you you don't believe in Jesus yet. You've never made a decision to accept Jesus into your life. Or perhaps you used to believe in Him in the past and you've fallen away. And today, you'd like to come back. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would come into your life. That you would be set free. That you would experience and accept His grace in your life today. So on the count of three, I'm going to say now, and if you want to believe in Jesus for the first time or if you want to come back to Him, why don't you raise your hand and make that decision in your heart. Are you ready? Three, two, one, now. Why don't you accept Jesus today? Amen. Fantastic. Let me pray for you that made that decision. God, I thank you for these beautiful people, your sons and daughters, that you have wanted them to come home for so long. And right now, God, I pray that as they come home, that you would fill them. You would fill their heart with your love and with your grace. And that condemnation is kicked out in the name of Jesus. Sin is gone. Legalism is gone. In Jesus' name, they are free today. We thank you, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's message on healthy thinking. Make sure you tune in next week for another great message. And I pray that these bless your lives and have a great week. See you then. Bye.